just want to go over, over, go before the, what we did earlier on so we can get back to doing some of what Alan started to settle. A conversational posture, I want you to have many different ways to explore this, right? A polite request to someone, if it was a cat I could say, will you take the top of this pen for me and pass it over, okay? It's not a question. I'm not going, will you take the top of the pen pass and pass it to me? It's, will you take the top of the pen, please? It's a polite request. <laughs> or like, oh, love, take the top of me pen for his pen. Still a polite request, Justin Geordie. That's the will you bit. Another one. Mohammed, can you tell me again how to say Zoroastrian in Persian? Again, it's not a question, it's a polite request. The question will be, oh, can you tell me how to say Zoroastrian in Persian, please? The tonality goes up at the end. Come on, assistants. The tonality goes up at the end, and it is a question. It's a yes, no. Here's another one. Should you really go out with that person? Because they're a bit of a scumbag. Should you really go out with that person? It's different to, should you really go out with that person? One's a question, one's a sort of polite request. So the conversational, very quickly for those who've arrived disgustingly late, stuff and dragging bits of cake in their bags, bits of McDonald's burger, wiping the juices of beautiful food off of them, or something like that. You can have a polite request to someone say, will you tell me what you just had for lunch, please? Can you tell me what you've had for lunch, please? Should you really have that for lunch? The are polite requests. Can you tell me what you had for lunch? Should you have really eaten that for lunch? Will you tell me what you've had for lunch? One's a question, one's a polite request. It's the same words, the tonality differs. If you change, again, the polite request, Imagine if you said to someone, Oi, mugger, you will take this pen top off. This is the will you, you will. One's a command, you will look this way. And now you're going, no, I freaking won't. <laughs> Another one is, you can understand this. Should you do this first or that? So the command is, you should, you can, you will, or I will. I should, I can, or he should, insert the pronoun, but the pronoun comes before the modal operator. When you switch it round, say, oh, can you take the top of this, please? It's still a polite request, but it's not a yes, no question. It's do it. You could answer that phone for me. Could you answer the phone for me? Could you answer the phone for me? So the conversational posture, even though it's a question, usually that's being posed. Another class of these, double dined blind. Let's presuppose one of the things that you as well, as your clients are there to do, is to learn to change stuff. In other words, to learn something, okay? Or to make a change. Is that a reasonable assumption? People are there to make some form of change. And they've turned up on your doorstep or your tent flap, or your garage door, or in your kitchen, or your converted loft with a treatment table, to make a change. That's kind of what we're in the business of doing at some level, at an abstract level, change making. I'll put a capital C for change, could be for something else. Making change. Now, the presupposition you want to do if you do timeline, is kind of presuppose that change will have already been made at some point in the future. And if we were to go into the future and look back, you might say something along the lines of, okay, going into the future, looking back, having made those changes, in your imagination, what can be some of the things that really stand out for you as you look back that let you know you're on your way to getting what you want? In other words, you're presupposing stuff. So let's assume crazy thing I know, you want to get someone to learn something to make a change. What you could say in terms of a double bind is, I don't know, because I don't, if you will, you can, I don't know if you can, discover for yourself 
that having put some effort into the process of learning, you find you really knew most of this already. Or it could just be that with just a little explication of a method, you discover yourself how easy it was to have learnt it that way. Which do you think it might be? I'm saying the same thing two different ways. And whatever someone goes, mm, 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 you're agreeing to the presupposition that you've learned it. Does that make sense? Can you say it again? No, I couldn't. I could give you an example of the same thing. I couldn't use the same words. Which way would you prefer to learn these language patterns? I don't know. Would it be better for you to realise through practice that you actually use most of these already and it's just a question of getting more familiar with them? Or would you prefer to put in a little bit of effort, maybe it's a good 15 minutes a day for a week, month, a year, until the penny, the pound, everything just falls into place and you realise you're really, really good at it? Or, a simple way, do you want to learn this easily or difficultly? It becomes a question of ease or difficulty. It's not about learning it. Does that make sense now, or will it make sense after you've had a little bit of practice? Milton Erickson once did something with Bill O'Hanlon. I've told you this before because you can remember that you've learned it as a really interesting way to refresh by repetition. It's one of the ways that refreshes the learning circuits, isn't it? That's right. So Bill O'Hanlon went along to Erickson after being his gardener for ages, an invite to come and sit in in a session and kind of work some stuff out for yourself. And what happened was he sat down, or he came in, and Erickson had two students in there, and they were trying to hypnotise each other, and there was a knock on the door, and he only went, come in, sit down, take off that hat, put it under the chair. And he said, these two people are trying to hypnotise each other, so he let them go for a bit, and he went, no, 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 this is how to do it. And he just talked to the floor for the next 45 minutes. You know when people say, you could be hypnotised, you might not. If someone just goes on and on and on and on and on, and on, and on, and someone's there, you'll either switch off at one point, or you get very absorbed. It's more likely you might switch off before you get absorbed, you could switch off as well. The idea is, it's just the ability to talk and talk until you calibrate someone's like that, or like that, and you know there's a state shift. What we're doing as well, the way we're doing hypnosis at the moment, it's very permissive and we know we're doing it. Sometimes people don't want to go into a trance quickly think about what I've just said and that was it so what you can do is you can talk and ramble but the process of specifically what I'm demonstrating is a great way that you can get it's like an experience or something there's a specific pattern that I'm using inside of this is a very interesting pattern because you'll start to notice that with repetition you can get it so easy and it's like where one sentence runs into another one. There's a pivot. It's like imaginary say so a person at lunchtime and they saw me too. There's words where you can stop a sentence and non sequitur, but they'll start another one. The classic one and patterns one is something where the hypnotist is looking at someone and they say, Oh at the end of your wrist a piece of jewellery, it's a watch what I'm about to do next. The pivot's the word watch. Imagine you are going to go into a trance state to learn. It's one of those things that children do naturally. They do it without trying, without struggling. And they don't need to think on the inside. Your own thoughts, aware of your own feeling, a sensation in your foot or your toe. Those digits on the end of your hands and fingers where you can count on your own internal experiences, your ears, your eyes, to filter the things that are particularly important to you can allow yourself to learn this so easily should you choose to learn this in a way that's right for you. With all the noises of children playing outside, things are going on. And inside, 
other things can happen to you in ways that you won't necessarily understand or process. Yet without trying, really trying, you can discover yourself, your thoughts, your own ways that allow you to take on your learning experience. Even now you come to think about it, all we're going to do is just practice coming back in a conscious way. Because we'd had a demonstration of what Alan was doing before. And there's a balance between spontaneity, because you've learned a pattern, because you can go in, you know how to change channels on a television, you make one switch here, we are all in this room learning something together. And the idea is through any sort of conscious behaviour, that's the way most people learn, with an attention, attention to do something. But at some point, it switches over to you. So you can start to work out a way that you can learn and internalize these. The way I found really useful was to write loads of these out. And the tag questions, ah, that's where I was going. I was just killing time to list, come back. I knew it would. When you think back, or remember back, or re-experience what Alan was doing much earlier on before we had lunch, Alan uses, in my opinion, a, a, a more than statistically, he uses a lot, in other words, of a thing called a tag question, doesn't he? You'll start to enjoy this, and we've learned stuff, haven't we? And you get that little head nod when you do it. So one of the tag questions that Alan uses, doesn't he? He uses tag questions a lot. You can find yourself using tag questions more easily. Can't you use tag questions to be pivot words? It's because, just what I was mentioning before, in times in your life, perhaps even more now that you're more aware of it, you've learned stuff, haven't you had an experience before where just by putting out what a tag question is, a haven't you, couldn't you, mightn't you, shouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, didn't you, will start another sentence. It's like, didn't you really have an experience before? Or you've learned something just before, didn't you? Now that you come to think about it, have a new experience, didn't you? Tag questions make great pivots. We'll start there. We'll start there.